Good morning. We'll begin this morning with number 263, 263. Wonderful words of life. We'll sing all three verses before our scripture reading and prayer. 263. Let's sing out together. Sing them over again to me. Wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see. Wonderful work of life. Words of life and beauty. Teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words. The blessed one gives to all wonderful words of life. Sinners to the loving call, wonderful words of life. Also freely given, wooing us to heaven. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words. Wonderful words of life, offer pardon and peace to all. Wonderful words of life, Jesus, our only Savior, sanctify forever. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. reading this morning will be from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians 5, beginning verse 12 through 24, 5, 12 through 24, and we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. And be at peace among yourselves. And we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the people minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men, see that none render evil for evil unto any, unto any man, but ever follow them that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesyings, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are thankful to Thee for another day of life. Thankful to You for allowing us to be able to be here today to worship You and to study more of Your Word. Thankful to Thee, Heavenly Father, for allowing us to have the freedom to do such without fear of persecution. Heavenly Father, please be with all those that have prepared lessons this morning and please help them to teach Your Word with all truth and with all conviction. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing your only Son to come down to this earth and set from our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, we say good morning and welcome this morning to the Bremen Church of Christ. We're grateful for everyone's presence here. We do have visitors among us. We have a very special group of visitors among us, the sojourners who have descended upon Camp and Gahee to uh, 
help us with some spring uh, tasks, and uh, we're certainly looking forward to the result of their and the fruits of their labor. We're thankful that they came and uh, chose to worship with us here at Bremen this morning. Welcome. We'll dismiss now to our classes with the nursery, preschool, kindergarten, and elementary school classes. Middle school, high school, and adult classes dismissed. First John chapter 3 is where we are in this particular class. It is good to have uh, those who are visiting with us uh, in our class this morning and with us in our worship today, as John has already mentioned. <clears throat> every, every year we are blessed with a group of uh, sojourners and their fearless leader, Pat, and so... <laughs> We're always delighted that they come, and at least one time while they're in the area and worship with us, it's always a pleasure, and we always get to see some of the ones who've been here before, and usually get to meet a few new ones along the way, so that's always a, a good thing indeed. <clears throat> First John, chapter 3, we have spent quite a bit of time talking about the first couple of verses in which he talks about the love of God that has been extended to mankind, enabling us to be called sons of God. And we spent a lot of time in that same connection talking about John chapter 3 and verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And it is indeed an awesome thought when we stop and reflect upon God, the Creator, the power, the majesty of God, who has a desire for man, part of his creation, to be with him eternally. And all that he has done out of his love for mankind to make that possible. So we've spent a lot of time with those verses in that regard. Now, in verse 3, by way of continued briefly reviewing, every man that hath this hope, what hope? The hope of eternal life, the hope of, of being with God, when, when He shall appear, the hope of seeing Him as He is, and the hope of being like Him. And that's exactly what verse 2 is all about, that we can have that kind of hope. And if we have that hope, then we will do what? Purify ourselves, according to verse 3. And so there's that cleansing, that purifying. The manner of life that we're to live as children of God with that hope before us. And it's hard to imagine that there are people in the world who can know anything at all about the love of God and not have the hope of being with Him eternally, and then having that hope, not searching the Scriptures to find how that that can become a reality. But God has made all of that possible for us. What a blessed privilege it is that we can be called 
sons of God. Verse 4, Whosoever committed sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. We've talked about that uh, idea of uh, transgression going beyond that which God has spoken. I don't think we discussed at any length at least in verse 4, but there are those who would suggest to us that we do not live under law today. And while it is true that we do not live under the law of Moses, we have been freed from that law. Christ took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Colossians chapter 2. Paul in Romans chapter 7 says we also are become dead to the law. What does the word dead or death suggest? Separation. Separate. We're separated from the law. You become dead to the law by the body of Christ that you should be married to another, even him is raised from the dead, that you should bring forth fruit unto God. First four verses of Romans chapter 7. Galatians chapter 3. Paul there emphasizes the fact that now that faith has come, we are no longer under a what? Schoolmaster. Now, just prior to that, he had said the law, with reference to the law of Moses, is a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. But now what? We're no longer under that schoolmaster. Therefore, we're no longer under the law of Moses. So there, there are any number of passages that help us to understand that aspect of it. But does that suggest that we're not under law, period? Absolutely not. For example, in um, <clears throat> Galatians chapter 6 and in verse 2, Bear ye one another's burden, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now you're going to fulfill a law if it doesn't exist. You'll recall in James chapter 1, Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. In James chapter 2, we are told that there is one lawgiver. Simple question. What does a law giver give law and so there are any number of verses again that we could use to help us understand that we are under law today the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death Paul wrote to the church at Rome and so when John writes here concerning the transgression of the law at this point, he's talking about the law of Christ, going beyond that which is authorized by Christ. That's basically saying the same thing that Paul said in writing to the church at Colossae when he said, Whatsoever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of. What does that little phrase mean? By the authority. We do have authority. We better have authority for what we do in matters of religion. If we do not, then what we're doing is in violation of the law of Christ, which is a transgression going beyond, which is defined here as sin. And so I wanted to go back and, and look at that concept. We are under law today. Now, a lot of people don't want to talk about law, but we are under law today. We must respect the law of Christ and ye know that, verse 5, ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. So here's at least some reason given to us to not be given to sin. Why did Christ come? Why was he manifest? To take away sin. If we live our life in sin, then we are in essence going contrary to the very thing for which Christ came to this earth. And certainly that's not something that would be commendable. 
in, in Matthew chapter 1, when we were being told Matthew's record of the coming birth of Christ, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall do what? Save his people from their sins. And so that's why he came. That was his purpose, to remove sin. So we certainly don't want to be involved in that from which Jesus came to save us. <clears throat> you have a similar concept in Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, actually based on something that Paul had said in the latter part of uh, chapter 5. But beginning in Romans 6, 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Answer, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? We've been made free from sin. That was the purpose of His coming. Those who have been obedient to His will have been made free from sin. Certainly would say to us then, you don't want to go back and live in sin. And so that's why, uh, why John would bring it up <clears throat> in this regard. We are now servants of righteousness, not servants to sin. In Romans chapter 6, again, later on, in that uh, same chapter, know ye not, that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. <clears throat> Who makes that choice? We make that choice, don't we? I make that choice for me, whether I want to be a servant of sin or a servant of righteousness. But God be thanked that whereas ye were the servants of sin, ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine delivered you, being then made free from sin, ye became servants of righteousness. That's why Jesus came. That was His whole purpose, to save man from sin, to, to enable us to be <coughs> righteous in the eyes of God. And so there is no sin in Christ. That's not the life that we're to live. We must be like Him. So He, born, he was born, lived, suffered, died, rose, ascended, crowned King of kings and Lord of lords in order that you and I could be forgiven of sin and be with God eternally. Again, I say that's indeed an awesome thought. Since there is no sin in Him, then how can we be involved in a life of sin? Verse 6, then, Whosoever abideth in Him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen Him, neither known Him. Now, this is an idea that gives a lot of religious people obviously a lot of difficulty, and it gives them some, they think at least, some biblical authority for the idea of the impossibility of apostasy. I think I've related to you a time or two the result of one of our campaigns a number of years ago when we came across the man who said, that he was saved and he gave a date 40, 50 years prior to that. He said, I've not sinned since. Well, <clears throat> and he would base it upon a passage like this. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. But there are some conditions here that far too many people ignore. And if we ignore the conditional aspect of it, then we're going to miss the point. The word abideth. What does that word really mean? It involves the matter of obedience. Literally, the word suggests permanency, to settle down into something. When you think about your own physical abode, you think about your home, you think about where you are on a permanent basis now sometimes, you get involved in sojourning and you leave that permanent place of abode, your home, go elsewhere. We all travel from time to time. But where is our place of permanency? We know where that is. 
It's our home. And that, that's what the idea is here to settle down into something. So, so in Christ shows a relationship to Christ. You go back to John chapter 15 in which Jesus said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. And he talks about fruit bearing and, and what is necessary for us to bear fruit according to that context. We've got to abide, the, the branches have to abide in the vine. That's us stay connected. Well, what would that suggest to us? Continuous action, wouldn't it? Go back to 1 John 1 7 again that we've already studied. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanseth us from all sin. If we walk, what does that word suggest? Continuous action. Then the cleansing involved. Continuous action. So as long as our action of walking in the light is continuous, the cleansing of the blood of Christ is continuous in its action. But what does that suggest to us? Does that say we can't quit walking in the light? Absolutely not. Does that say that we are not going to commit sin? You continue reading in that same chapter, 1 John 1, after he talked about walking in the light. We have the continual cleansing. He went right on to say, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. He repeated that a couple of verses later. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word, the truth, is not in us. There is a difference in living a life of sin, continuous action, abiding in sin, if you please, and the occasional committing of sin out of human weakness. There's a big difference. And that's the point that so many people miss with regard to, to verse, verse 6, whosoever abideth, the idea of permanency, we're settled in, we're we're in Christ. We're living that Christian life. Uh, we're not giving up on that. In um, two or three other verses, maybe in that connection, in Titus <clears throat> chapter 2 and in verse 14, we learn again with regard to Christ who gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto Himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. So as a result of what He's done for us, there is that life that we're to live, and, and it's a life of good works. It's a life that we're to give ourselves to in that regard. In this same <clears throat> context, in verse 6, whosoever sinneth, and there's the opposite of the abiding in Christ. Here's one who's given himself over to a life of sin. Not the occasional sin, but the life of sin. Hath not seen him, neither known him. And so we have to make that distinction, otherwise we miss everything that, that John is talking about in, in this regard. So the idea of abiding. We abide through obedience. Matthew seven twenty one. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of the Father which is in heaven. You think about 1 John 1 again and the, the concept of not sinning at all. John writing says, if we walk in the light, we've already looked at that, John's writing to those who are members of the Lord's church. But he said, if we confess our sins, why are you going to confess something you don't have or can't have? That passage wouldn't make any sense. If once a child of God you can't sin, it wouldn't make no sense at all. 
And there are a lot of other verses in, in that regard. Acts 8, uh, with regard to Simon, repent and pray. Simon had already been baptized. He's a child of God. Then according to that theory, he could not sin and thus would not need to repent of anything. So there are just so many passages that are contrary to so much erroneous thinking that, that exists in the religious world. So what John is talking about here in verse 6, by, very, by the very nature of the word abideth, is a settling into something, a, a, a permanent situation, whether it's the abiding in Christ or the concept of sinning here. They're both in the same context of a way of life. So we, we choose that way of life. Little children, verse 7, he says, Let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. So you come out of verse 6, this idea of, of continual action, whether abiding in Christ or in sin, he encourages, and again, he uses that expression, little children. Well, is he talking physically there? No, he's talking spiritually. He's not talking to, to small children in that regard. He's talking to those who are in the same family, who have the same father, who enjoy the same privileges, very tender affection, a thing that John does quite often. We noted that uh, back in verse 2 when he said, Beloved, don't just read over that word, it has significance. And when he talks about little children, that has significance. So he says, don't be deceived, let no man deceive you. With regard to what? Well, what did he just get through talking about? Abiding in Christ and sinning. So don't be deceived about that matter, that there is no sin, that there's no condemnation, that the Christian can't sin. But those that do righteousness. In Acts 10, in verses 34 and 35, Luke records something about righteousness in this regard. Then Peter opened his mouth and said of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of person, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Now what is righteousness? Right doing. I mean, that's about as simple a definition and an accurate one as you can get of righteousness. It's right doing. Well, how do we know what is righteous? How do we know what right doing is all about? Where is it found? In the gospel. We're familiar with Romans 1, 7, 16. Not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Verse 17 says, For therein, in the gospel of Christ, therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, The just shall live by faith. So if you want to know what righteousness is, just open up God's book and you can find out what righteousness is. And so then Peter's statement is that if we, if we work righteousness, so we've got to do what God says do. That's, that's the whole point that, that John is dealing with here in chapter 3 is that uh, continual obedience to the will of God. Righteousness comes by obedience. And so to be righteous, one must do righteously. There's no other way. You cannot separate righteousness and deeds of everyday living. It's the way of life. In uh, Ephesians chapter 4, Paul there encourages those brethren to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you were called. Then he tells them how to walk with all lowliness, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, endeavor to keep the human spirit in the bond of peace. Walk worthy of the vocation. What's he saying to those people? You have been called. How are we called? Through
through the gospel, Paul writing to the church at Thessalonica, whereunto he called you by our gospel. We're called by the gospel. So Paul, in essence, is saying there, you've been called, you've answered that call through their obedience to the gospel. Now what's their responsibility? Live like it. Live like you've been called. Live like a child of God. There's a way to live. It's a way of life. Everyday living. That's what he's talking about in this regard. So don't be deceived. If you, if you do righteousness, then you have assurance from God that you are righteous. What's the difference in righteousness and righteous? Not everybody at once. All right, one is the action, the other is the result of the action. Righteousness, the doing of right things, makes us righteous, which has to do with our relationship with God. And so out of the action, the relationship with God is generated. And so if we want to be righteous, right in the eyes of God, then we've got to live righteously, do that which is right on a daily basis. That's really what um, John is dealing with in this regard. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now he's, he's continuing with this, with this same concept in verse 8. He's just simply showing the origin of sin. What is the origin of sin? It's of the devil. It's not of God. It's of the devil. Again, he that committeth. What does the word committeth suggest? Continuous action. And see, we don't, if we don't get that, then we're going to miss everything that John's talking about here. He's talking about a way of life, continuous action. In each of these verses, he's not talking about an incident here, an incident there, an incident somewhere else. He's talking about a way of life. And the word committeth is the same concept, habitual, that which we do by habit, way of life. It is of the devil. You recall in James chapter 1, down about verse 12, 13, 14, James says that when we are tempted, who are we not to blame? Don't blame God. God cannot be tempted with sin, neither tempteth he any man. Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth what? Death. Physical death. Spiritual death. Spiritual death. Separation from God. That's what it's all about. And so... Uh, it's, it's not of God, it is of the devil. John chapter 8 and verse 44 suggests the very same thing. He's a liar and the father thereof. Now, go back to John chapter 8 just a minute. I want to look at uh, something very briefly there. John chapter 8, there's a rather lengthy section beginning in verse thirty. He spake these words, as he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye do what? Continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. If there's any doubt about what John is talking about over here in First John, go back and read the gospel according to John. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Then answered, uh, they answered him, We be Abraham's seed, we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered, Verily I say unto you, Whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin. Now what's his contrast in this context? Continuing in his word or committing sin. Continuing in his word are continuing in sin. 
That's the uh, contrast in the context. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. I know that you're Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. Uh-oh. My father, your father? What's the context? Satan versus God. Satan versus God. Jesus is simply saying, my father, that's God. Your father, obviously, is not the same as my father in this context. Your father, obviously, in that case, is the devil. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. You see, they were putting so much into that fleshly descendancy that at this point is going to mean absolutely nothing. He said, if ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then he goes on down and you come down to verse 44 and he makes it plain what he's talking about. Ye are of your father the devil. So when John writing over in 1 John is talking about the doing of righteousness versus the committing of sin, it's the same concept that he's talking about back in the gospel according to John. That, that way of life, that abiding, that, that concept of permanency in that regard. So notice as well, just a side point from John 8. Those people, those Jews, claim to be children of whom? Of Abraham. Well, Jesus said, it doesn't matter what you claim, it's what you are that counts and you are children of the devil. Now what's the application of that to us today? We can claim to be whatever we want to be, but the proof is where? The way we live our lives on a daily basis. And that's what John is really, in essence, uh, and we noted earlier, just by way of a back reference here, uh, we, we had noted earlier how John in his writing has already basically said to these people in chapter 1, you are what you claim to be. I think a lot of this letter is designed to not try to straighten out some problem that these brethren were facing, but to encourage them to continue on in what they were already doing. And As in this chapter, don't be deceived. You're on the right track. You're doing good. So don't let anybody deceive you about this matter. Somewhat of a letter of encouragement to them in that regard. And so he's continuing on in, in that same sense. Uh, so the idea of persistent sin here is involved. You're of, uh, he that committed sin is of the devil. The devil. Is the devil just the figment of somebody's imagination? No. He is a being, and I'm not going to get into all of that, the origin of the devil and that kind of thing this morning. That, that's a totally different study, but simply to realize and point out that he is a real being. Uh, he is alive. He is a being. He is a tempter. First introduced to him where? Genesis chapter 3. And he ceased to exist when? He hasn't yet, has not, and he will be destroyed with his followers in the devil's hell. But he is real. In Peter's writing, Peter said, be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He's an enemy. He's an adversary. What's his sole purpose? To destroy your soul and mine. What is the purpose of the Son of God? 
to save your soul and mine. And so their works are totally opposed to each other. That's why Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 7, no, chapter 6, verse 24, no man can serve two masters. You can't serve them both because they are so opposed to each other. Can't serve God and mammon in that regard. So Satan is a, is a real being. He's alive. Uh, he is, uh, as noted here, uh, he was from, uh, he, the devil sent it from the beginning. And so for this purpose was the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. It destroy what? Not destroy the devil. Destroy the works of the devil. And so the devil is an adversary. He tries to lead us captive into sin. And so the work of our Lord is to allow us to be able to overcome that. Overcome. We can overcome. The song, faith, is the victory that overcomes the world. The word world, they're obviously used in the sense of the sinful ways of the world. And so, again, when you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the great chapter on the resurrection, beginning with about verse 55 and verses following, O grave, where is thy victory? Where is the sting of death? You see, there is no strength in the grave and in death. Because there's victory over both in Jesus Christ. But that's why you have all of that big discourse in, in chapter 15, 1 Corinthians, about the resurrection itself. And encouragement. We're not living for just the here and now. Yes, we're going to pass this life one of these days. But we're going to be raised as Jesus was raised. And that's part of the proof, 1 Corinthians 15, that we're going to be raised. Christ was raised. And then out of that, of course, that eternity with God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, Paul talks about if this earthly tabernacle be destroyed, it's going to, it's, it's decaying. Is there anybody in here this morning that does not sense to some degree that this physical body is decaying? Is there, anybody doesn't, doesn't realize that yet? Uh, yeah, I'm um, Pat came in this morning and was talking about aches and pains and whatever from her work day yesterday. It, uh, I see several people sitting around with ease on. What does that indicate? Something's got a little weaker than it used to be. Uh -huh. This old body's decaying. You get up in the morning, you feel aches and pains that you used to didn't feel. It's vanishing away. Huh? Can you, can you really see? Huh? Decaying, passing away. Can't remember, and I know none of y'all have that problem, but memory begins to slip a little bit, vanishing away. But in spite of that, what do we have looked forward to? A building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. That's what we have looked forward to. And that's what John wants these people to understand. All right, Lord willing, we'll pick up there next Sunday morning.